A warm welcome to all our friends and our viewers. We are still going live uh, with our lesson study and we have started a new lesson. We're looking at God's covenant, his promises that he establishes. And today we're looking at lesson three. And uh, before we get started, before I even introduce the, plot, uh, the panel, I'll ask my elder, Elder Enver, if you could please um, take us to the Lord in prayer. No problem, thank you. Let's close our eyes. Our Father, which art in heaven, Lord Jesus, want to say thank you once again for your goodness, for your love and your mercy, Father. Thank you, Father, that we could once again um, be found in your holy day of rest, Father, the Sabbath day. That's the day that you've set apart, so that we can bond with you and just catch up and, and, and just fellowship with, with you and with one another, Lord Jesus, as we're about to go into the lesson. As we're about to discuss, I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit may be with us and um, to use us, Lord Jesus. Speak to us, speak through us, and speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. A warm welcome, friends. Thank you. You could be joining us from Cape Town, you could be joining us from California, or even Calfinia. Thank you so much for being part of the Word of Truth family. Um, this evening, we have our brothers, Elder Enver and Elder David. I'll start with Elder Enver. If you could please introduce yourself, and then over to Brother David. Over to Brother David. Yeah. Thank you very much, Elder David. Elder David. Yes, my name is Elder Enver. Um, I currently attend the Mitchell's Plain Seventh Adventist Church in Portland. And yes, um, I've been asked to be the youth leader for this year. Um, so God bless us as we enjoy this program. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. Uh, it's me, Brother David. I'm also from Mitchell's Plain, Save the Adventist Church uh, in Portland with uh, my lovely elder here. I am still a man married to one wife, praise the Lord, the same wife. And uh, I'm only, it's only a privilege to be here this afternoon with you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much to my elders. Thank you, Elder Enver, Elder David. Uh, my name is Kevin, and I'm also part of the Word of Truth family. Uh, worshiping at Hader Falls SDA Church in Cape Town and also married to one wife, happily married, and uh, we'll stay that way until Christ comes. And uh, so our lesson starts. We are looking at all future generations, and it's a very beautiful lesson. Uh, the panel that I have is ready. We are going to be covering the lesson, looking at uh, Noah and I, I enjoyed last week's lesson so much as the panel was sharing, and I'm sure I'm going to enjoy as um, my two elders are going to share with us as we look at all future generations. Our memory text, we are reading from Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. I like this because this is where we find the word grace first appearing in the Bible, and it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And as we look at um, this text, which will be guiding us throughout the lesson, um, the author gives us a short analogy of uh, bacteria. So as he breaks down ba how bacteria grows, he says it's so small, but yet when it's given the right conditions to multiply um, from that one small cell, um, it multiplies into billions if the conditions are right. And looking at that, he says, um, you know, it's the same with sin. You know, if the, I would say the conditions are right, uh, sin multiplies in the world unless if it is put in check. And so we want to find out, as we started in first lesson, what went wrong? And we'll see um, how can God's people um, stay rooted in the covenant that he has placed. And so we'll look at what did sin do to God's creation? Remember, God said it was good. It was very good. And then what were some of the characteristics of this man called Noah? who found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and what elements were involved in the covenant with Noah. And we'll answer some of the questions like, in what ways is God's grace revealed in the covenant with Noah before the flood? Um, I, I was looking at all these questions, and I thought, one hour is not going to be enough, uh, gentlemen, to cover this. So as we look at the sin principle, and then I'll give over to my friends um, to, to comment. The sin principle, as we read from Genesis chapter 6, and verse five, reading in your hearing, this is what the Bible says. Um, 
Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 from the NKJV. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So we see here as the Bible starts off, it shows us that there was something wrong with humanity during Noah's time because the intent of their heart was evil continually. You know, the Bible doesn't give us um, much detail, but I believe that this generation during Noah's time, something happened and we need to trace where did it all start? And when you go to Genesis chapter three, verse six, we remember the conversation of um, Eve and the serpent, where the serpent asked, did God really say that you should not eat from this tree? And Eve says, God said we should not eat, no touch of it. And we see the progression after um, Adam and Eve, we see Cain, um, who when he gave his offering, that wasn't the acceptable offering. Um, he was upset that God didn't uh, um, accept his offering. And you continue with the progression, he kills his brother Abel. And um, some years down the line, we have Noah and the antediluvian world during Noah's time, who were evil continually. So we see that in all this, sin just didn't come out from nowhere, but there was a starting point. And from the world's perspective, it started in the Garden of Eden. But when you go deeper into the Bible, we know that it started with Lucifer, who rebelled and um, tried to take God's position, which is impossible. So sin, because it was left unchecked from that time on, it grew, it multiplied, and you find out of a population of I don't know how much, uh, only Noah, his wife, his sons and wives, three sons and three wives are the only ones who are found to be doing what is right. Um, I know my elders would say, let's go into prophecy as well, because we know that the people like um, Enoch, Methuselah, who were righteous, you know, but they died before the flood came. Um, so let's look at this man called Noah. Um, trying to be brief here and it says in chapter 6 of Genesis verse 9 the description given of Noah and I'll pose this question to brother Enver and brother David uh, Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 this is the genealogy of Noah Noah was a just man perfect in his generations Noah walked with God that's the description of given of Noah. And so we see he's a righteous man, he's blameless, and he walked with God. Um, can the same things be said about us today, brothers? Uh, if the Bible was rewritten um, in the year of the coronavirus, uh, brother David was found to be a righteous man, blameless, and walked with God. So let me just pose this question before we continue um, with uh, the following days, Tuesday and Wednesday. Any takers on this question? Yes, Brother David. Is, here's the thing that we need to understand. Man. As much as Noah was a, a righteous man, as, as much as he was blameless, um, some might even say that word can be translated without sin. Uh, and as much as he walked with God, because of what happened in the Garden of Eden um, and the sin that originated there, originally that was promulgated there. He was still a sinner. And it's, it's fascinating that just one verse before the description of Noah and his character, um, the Bible tells us and introduces us to a word called grace. Where God is actually, um, and this is just my opinion, trying to tell us that, yes, I am giving you grace and freely. And But just look at this. Here is someone that by all definitions of the word grace actually doesn't need it because he is walking with me. But because he has inherited sin from his father, his, his grandfather, uh, that brought it here to us, um, I am still going to give it to him. And that is what's so beautiful me about this lesson is that we need to understand that even though Noah was blameless and he was righteous and he was continually seeking to please God, he knew that he still needed God's grace. And when we compare, and, and Ish, it's sometimes difficult because this was a tough lesson for me. Because when I have to compare my life to Noah's life, I'm like, hey, I'm falling short. No? But more than that, if I have to compare my life to that of Christ, I see that I am falling 
even eh, it's, it's it's horrible but and you know there's always a but it's the beautiful thing that there's always a but but if it were not for grace it would have been impossible for me to uphold it Thank you so much, you. Brother David. Before Brother Anwar takes over and takes us through to um, the following days, Tuesday and Wednesday, um, Brother David mentioned that you look at a person like Noah, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and then his description comes next. And we also see the similar words given to a man called Job in Job chapter one. You know, And um, if it wasn't for God's grace, uh, we wouldn't be able to stand here. We wouldn't be able to speak um, about such wonderful truths, but we speak and we stand here or sit here because of this thing called grace, which started with God in the Old Testament. So, Brother Enver, you can take um, take uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, but you can also answer the question. Oh, thank you very much, gentlemen. That was well answered eh, from both of you. And I just wanted to add just one more element to um, what um, Elder David said there. Um, and that is, and Noah walked with God. And that is the beauty part that God gives us this opportunity to walk with him, you know. Um, and then I don't, I don't want to repeat what, 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 what David mentioned, but um, when it's just something beautiful about us walking with God, man. Um, regardless of our sinful state or the sinful uh, planet that we find ourselves uh, after the flood, especially because we know when God created everything was perfect. At then, um, this, per this perfect plan of God um, was not the same anymore, and just it was just nice to to, to read that. Um, these are the generation of Noah, of, of Noah. Noah was a just and a perfect man in his generation. So in other words, he set the example amidst everything. And like David said, but, <laughs> there is a but, a be, but in this case, the beautiful but. In, in, in other words, Noah was an example in his generation and Noah walked with God. It's kind of similar, like, like, like Enoch, like what you mentioned earlier on um, Elder Kevin, that um, um, during the time of, of, of the flood or, or before, before the flood, um, Noah was very instrumental as well as Enoch and Methuselah. They were instrumental in, in, in building the ark. And we know the, 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 the instructions from God, the very clear instructions from God to, to build the ark. But what I wanted to say is that um, there, there was there, not only Noah, there was Enoch as well. There's, there was uh, Methuselah and their sons. So, um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful, just that we can walk with God. And I will continue um, on Tuesday, the covenant with Noah. Now, God says in, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 18, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives with you. So here we see there's a beautiful um, picture being portrayed here that um, God makes a covenant here. And I just highlighted this portion um, on this part. It says God and humankind entered into an agreement. It was a very simple agreement, yet from um, from from the, the, the human's eye, where <laughs> uh, uh, there are more elements that meet the eye, right? It says to begin with, there was an element of obedience, right? Uh, on, on, on humanity's part, God says to Noah that he and his family shall go into the ark. So as you can see, as we know, a covenant is basically an agreement. This is God's agreement that you, if you are obedient, you will enter into the ark. Um, they have their part to do. And if they do not do it, unfortunately, the covenant is then broken. So um, there is a condition. There was a condition, basically, uh, to the benefits. But ultimately, we see that the ark was basically God's restoration plan for humanity. Um, I just
just want to go further down there and it says God says that this is my covenant right what does that tell us about the basic nature of a of, 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 of the covenant what difference would there be in our concept of a covenant if the Lord had called it our covenant and not his covenant right um, now before I, I, I answer that I'll, I'll give my, my panelists a, a chance to do maybe to add if they want to uh, if not then I'll just continue uh, David you can go first <laughs> you are such a gracious man my dear brother such a gracious man um It is, it's, it's, it's a tough question um, because the answer might be too simple. That makes sense, <laughs> at least to me. But here's the thing. Um, I'm not really going to answer the question, but rather give a comment that if we look at what a covenant is, and um, on Tuesday it makes mention of conditions that needs to be met before a covenant needs to be um, fulfilled. So in modern day terms, we can see this as a contract, meaning that before you receive the rewards of the contract, you first need to do A, B, C, D, and E, or maybe just A and B. The problem that we have is not many people realize that they have a choice because the covenant is underlined by this wonderful thing that God has given us and it's free will. He is allowing you to see what your choices is getting you. So um, in the in on Tuesday's lesson, there is this man falls overboard into the water, and we can take it further and say that you are drowning in your own sin, and someone throws you a life preserver. But they tell you you need to first agree to the deal for you to be saved, and that is to hold on to what has been given to you. Sometimes we don't realize that there are better choices out there. If, if it makes sense. We don't realize that God has better choices in store for us, but for us to receive the rewards of those better choices, we first need to agree to what he has set out for us. Now, it might sound prescriptive, and this is where the danger comes in. Many people might see it as prescriptive, but because we cannot see the end result of the current course that we are on, yeah, I'm, I'm going to start rambling, so I'm just going to leave it there. I'm really just going to leave it there. Thank you, Brother David. Uh, Brother Enver is going to continue, but I wanted to mention um, why God says it's my covenant, because God is the one who initiates it. You know, on, on, on our part, there's nothing that we can initiate. He's the initiator of the covenant. That's why it's his covenant. And as Brother David mentioned, then our part is through obedience to now play a, an active role in accepting, uh, I would say, the terms and conditions of that beautiful uh, salvific covenant. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Beautifully said. said. Um, and, and with the analogy that, that David um, spoke about, the, the, the preserved, uh, if um, this is once again how God displays His grace, and we were introduced to to the to the to the word grace again, and we know that grace is just God's unmerited favor. So there's nothing that we can do um, to deserve God's grace, but yet God still throws in the lifeline for us to to grab. And and if you look at it, the the, the man that's tossed over into the sea doesn't have a choice but to hold on to the preserver if not he will die and 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 if you look at it it's it, it, um that's god's covenant there's nothing that the man can give back to god <laughs> or, or or the person that throws the the lifeline in in other words he is the more the man human being is benefiting actually from this um the the, the preserver right and all he needs to do is to, to reach out. That's basically what, what David wa, uh, was saying there. That we just need to reach out. There's something that we need to just do. But God has done the great part already. And I think that was beautifully summed up there, gentlemen. Right. And then uh, I'll go over to, to, to Wednesday. And uh, it speaks about the sign of the, the rainbow. And I must be honest with you. 
when I, I looked at the rainbow when I was very younger, it always fascinated me, especially maybe the first time that I could recall <laughs> of, of, about the rainbow and its beautiful colors, you know. Um, and even now, even if we look at the rainbow now, we are still fascinated with the beautiful colors. And I know it depends maybe on, on the daylight or where you are, but when you see those beautiful rays of colors, it just, it is, it is just, you just marvel at God's beautiful handiwork. But we know it's, it's not as simple as just a sign of a rainbow. Once again, I think when we look at the rainbow, we need to remember that covenant that God made with his people. And, and the covenant that, the, the, the sign that, that, that God sent in, in the rainbow was that um, he will never again send um, a flood over the earth to, to, to destroy the earth with floods. And I think that was very, very, very beautiful. Um, and that is basically what the, the, the rainbow symbolizes here. I just want to highlight, I just want to read from the, the lesson part here. It says God's word here are to all people, um, to every living creature of all flesh for all future generations. So it's not just uh, limited to, to back then to Noah, but it is um, to all people, to every living creature, to all flesh. God's words are universal, all-encompassing, regardless of whether anyone chooses to obey the Lord or not. It, it is still there. That promise, that, that, that sign that God will never send the, 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 uh, the, a flood again, that is still the sign there. Regardless whether you are obedient or not, you will still see that rainbow. You will still see that promise from God. In this sense, the concept of covenant here is not used. Um, it is not used as it is used anywhere else in the Bible, right? When talking about the relationship between God and human beings, so this basically once again just shows, you know, this is God's covenant once again. Right, um, and then I would like to just in ending, just go quickly to the to the last part. In what sense does the covenant also reveal God's grace? Who initiated this covenant? Who is the ultimate benefactor? Right, and and if we look at it, um, it sounds like God is benefiting from this. But if you if you really look at it, we are actually benefiting actually much more. And and the lesson brings it out also so beautiful. It right the back. Um, God's part, of course, is never to destroy the world with a flood. How could our knowledge of what the rainbow symbolizes influences us to live in obedience to the Lord? In short, are there some um, implied obligations on our part when we look up into the sky and see the rainbow? That's a question. Think of the, of the whole context in which the rainbow came and the lessons we can learn from that account and like i say whether um, we are obedient or not god made a covenant and he and he, and he, he gave the sign basically that said look never again will i destroy this earth with a flood so with it i'll, I'll, I'll sign off to um, elder david maybe if he wants to add to, to this um, to wednesday as well or elder kids but uh, i'll buy i'll, I'll buy out for now Thank you so uh, much, before, Elder Enver. Um, Brother David, you can go ahead. <laughs> before I continue, I would uh, just like to give you a chance to maybe comment if you would like, Brother Kevin. Mine is a question. Um, I don't know if you've observed uh, how the term rainbow has been, um, I would say, abused over the past few years. Um, Brother Enver, thank you so much. You brought it clearly that the rainbow should remind us of God's grace of not destroying the world with the flood. But we see the rainbow used in so many different organizations and groups and cults. Is it because people have forgotten the true meaning of the rainbow as we read about it in Genesis? Or is it because we've added our own understanding to this term of the sign of a rainbow? Uh, South Africa, we're a rainbow nation. Uh, there are groups that call themselves the rainbow group because they are all inclusive. So when we look at the rainbow, do people still think about it as this is God's covenant with men or it has lost its meaning? That's what I wanted to ask. 
my brother. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've noticed it as well. And um, I, I think it's more a case of trying, most people trying to, to unify or rally around a certain point. Um, and I think that a lot of what God has intended has been used for, for other stuff over the years. Um, yeah, I will not get into it now. Otherwise, we will sit here the whole night. Uh, but when I come to Eidefeld again, uh, we will have a lovely discussion on that one. But we move over to Thursday. And the title for the day says, Only Noah was left. Genesis 7 verse 23 tells us, He blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the ground. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the air, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those there that were with him in the ark. So in this text, one finds that the first mention of the concept of remnant, not the word, but the, the concept of remnant uh, meaning was left. We find it across the Bible in Genesis 45 verse seven, we see, and God sent me before you to preserve you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. Um, and then the last one I just will touch on here can be found in Isaiah 4 verse 3. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem. Now, when the flood happened, the creator of the world also became the judge. So here we see that a near cataclysmic judgment raised the question whether all life on earth, now this means human life, would be destroyed and if not, who would be the survivors? Who would be the remnant? And we saw and we can see in the Bible that it is Noah and his family. Now, Noah's salvation was linked to God's covenant with him. Now, this covenant originated and was executed by God and they survived only because of what God did for them. Now, if we read the whole flood in event, we see that God told him, build a boat. But it goes beyond that. If God tells him, build a boat, build it this way, put the door in the side. Now, if we see depictions of the ark, we see that this massive door is... <laughs> How can I put it? It's a huge door. So they couldn't, wouldn't have been able to close it, number one. Number two, for those of us that know the sea, the boats and all of that stuff, you kind of need a rudder to steer a boat or even some oars to maybe propel the boat forward or in the direction that you need to go. But this arc, the design of it, was more like a house that can float. No rudder, meaning that Noah and his family completely put their trust in God's hands. So that is one of the things we need to take cognizance of the fact of this covenant that God had with, with, with Noah, that number one, he trusted God fully. He didn't understand what God was trying to do, but he trusted God fully. Number two, on the occasions of them entering the ark and exiting the ark, they did so on God's instruction. God told him, right, go in and stay there. And only when it was safe for them to come out, God told him, now you can go out. So here again, we see that besides trusting God, they implicitly followed the directions of God. Now, they survived only because of what God did for them however important their cooperation was. Now, whatever Noah's covenant obligations were, and no matter how faithfully he executed him, his only hope was hanging on one thing, and that is God's mercy. Now, we can go into last day events, and, and that we will spend hours upon hours discussing that. And it includes a time when God will have a remnant. This we can find in Revelation 12, verse 17. Now, in what ways are we making decisions every day? This is my question to the panel, if they, they would like to comment. If not, we can move on to Friday. But in what ways are we making decisions every single day that could impact just where we finally stand 
at that time when a remnant of God will be on this earth. Panelists? Um, Elder Enver can go ahead, go ahead and I'll speak after him. That's fine. You can you can continue, Elder Elder um, David. <laughs> I'm enjoying. Thank you, Brian. Okay, so let's look at the following. Then this was taken from the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume One, page two sixty five, and I found this quote powerful and perplexing at the same time. The rainbow, a natural physical phenomenon, was a fitting symbol of God's promise, never to destroy the earth again by a flood. Inasmuch as the climatic conditions of the earth would be completely different after the flood and the rains would in most parts of the world take the place of the former beneficent due to moisten the soil, something was needed to quiet men's fears each time rain began to fall. The spiritual mind can see in natural phenomena God's revelation of himself. Thus, the rainbow is evidence to the believer that the rain will bring blessing and not universal destruction. Now, what I love about this quote, and this is again the wonder of God's grace and mercy. He knew that after this, after the way that he destroyed humanity, you could almost say for, for their sinfulness, they would be afraid to worship because now they would see him as an exacting and fearful God. But the promise that's in the rainbow saying that I will not again destroy the earth with water. So the blessings of rain that I would send you after times of drought, don't see it as a time where I'm here to destroy you. And then it's sometimes we, how can I put it? We look fearfully at what God has done in the past and we use that as an excuse to perpetuate our choices at this time. Now, in summary, we noted that the covenants God made with Noah are the first to be discussed explicitly in the Bible. They display his gracious interest in the human family and his desire to enter into a saving relationship with them. God reaffirmed his covenant with Noah and it was Noah's commitment to God that shielded him from the prevailing apostasy and eventually saved him and his family from the devastating judgment of the flood. I'm just going to pause there quickly. How often have we seen where people, maybe God says, listen, if you do this, I will save you. If you do that, I will be with you. I will bless you. And many people look at those conditions as restrictive. Um, isn't it possible that maybe the reason why God is saying, but don't do that or don't do this, is that he wants it to be a guardrail against much worse things. And sometimes we just take things for granted. Um, and that's my question. What do you guys think? Do we take God's mercy for granted? Uh, I, I think, you know, when, when you mentioned that, I think we do take God's mercy for granted. And I'm reminded of how parents um, would try and caution children against doing certain things, you know, because they already have been teenagers, so they know, uh, yes, times have changed, but parents, godly parents, have been given some wisdom to be able to see or discern that if my child does this, or if they hang out with this kind of people, they are in danger of falling into this particular problem. But if they do this, then uh, this good thing will happen. And so God being omnipotent um, and, and knowing much better than our parents, when he actually says that, he's not being restrictive, but he's actually saying, I'm doing this because I know what lies ahead. And so because I love you so much, why don't you listen to what I'm saying? And we see that countless times in the Bible uh, when he says to the children of Israel, um, follow me, keep my commandments, and these blessings will follow. But if you disobey, these curses will follow. And we see that time and time again, they fall into apostasy. They break the covenant with God. And they're taken captive so many times. So I think they're actually for our benefit when God puts those guardrails there to benefit us, like the health messages and um, the social um, restrictions 
well, I would, I would not say restrictions, but the limitations that God has placed. He knows that if I allow my children to have free reign in some things, uh, it might be terrible. So um, God is merciful in all that he says in his word. Thank you so much, Brother Kevin. Brother Anvil, my Udrlam, do you have something to say? Yeah, man, beautiful, beautiful. I was listening to, to both of you. Very, very, very beautiful, very profound. Just to come back to your earlier question, um, based upon the understanding of the last day events, which includes a time when God will have a remnant, what parallels can we learn from the story of Noah? And you know what? I don't take it uh, for granted if uh, the Bible says you know, Noah was upright, he was blameless, and he walked with God. And that is, that is something that we can learn from our, our, our forefathers, you know, um, that as Elder Kevin just mentioned now, obedience to God saves us from so many things, man. And even if our, even in our, in our, in our, in our best behaviors, we still fall short of the glory of God. And that is where God's grace comes in. But the, the lessons or the parallels that I can learn is that as long as we walk with God, and if you, if you look at the instructions um, that God has given to Noah to, uh, to build the ark, it was very specific instructions, very detailed. And you would have to be a fine craftsman in order to, to, to construct the, the ark. And I think I've read somewhere uh, that the ark was not supposed to, to, to move like a ship. It was just to be stationary at that point. Understand, and that that is how detailed God is, and that is the detailed plan that Noah followed. And in in, in in that, in doing that, what what Noah did, Noah obeyed God to the T. And I think if if we um, looking at the signs at, at the last day events, we can see all these signs, all the warning signs are there out there, and yet um, you find that people don't. Uh, obey God or don't trust in God or don't uh, um, display a faith uh, that 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 uh, pointing to a, a, a coming savior and that is some of the things that we need to instill within our families and we need to continue with this walk with God so that in our generation as it was in the generation of, of Noah Noah walked with God and that is the example that we have from Noah, and like we said, there was Enoch as well, and there was Methuselah, and 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 many other as well. You know the um, and this is something that we can take. You know uh, when we make our everyday decision, it it's actually very much simple for, for us now nowadays because all we need to do is make that decision on a daily basis. Like yesterday's decisions is gone. We only have today. <laughs> So um, tomorrow we start off on a, on a clean slate again. And that is how, how simple it is. But um, we need to uh, obey God and we need to follow his word to the T. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brother Enver and Brother Kevin. Um, I just have a couple of more things to say. Uh, Noah did not, Noah did more than warn his generation of God's approaching judgment. The purpose of his warning was to help the people sense their need of salvation. And you'll see today that the truths of salvation are generally unpopular. Um, I want us to think this week of why does it hinder so many people from accepting God's plan for their salvation? Brother Inver started touching on it, but I want us to, as a panel, as, as those who will be watching this, to think of what might be hindering you from accepting God's plan for your salvation. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Brother David, for um, taking us through Thursday and Friday so beautifully. And thank you, Brother Anvil, for the comments. But you gave us a question, uh, and I thought we might have five minutes to answer that question. Why are the truths of salvation generally unpopular? Uh, you know, when you present um, issues of salvation or the gospel, it's unpopular and maybe we can answer that question and uh, after that we come to a summary of 
what we've been talking about all future generations brother david would you like to help us with this question why when you knock on your neighbor's door and bring the truth of salvation it's not accepted as when you're inviting them to a game of soccer what what could be the reason and then i'll give brother enver afterwards um for me and from personal experience when uh, people have generally told me no when we did door to door they in how felt like um it was and then the one time the one person actually gave a reason I still feel muita, meaning it's it's too much trouble. Uh, many people see being a Christian, being um, a follower of Christ, uh, following God, doing what He wants you to do in your life, allowing Him to do things in your life, is too much trouble. They feel that they can't do what they want to do. Um, they want to be in charge. They want to be in control. But when they fall off the boat into the water, he's often the first one who they call upon. Um, why so many people disregard the, the, the truths of, of um, their own personal salvation is because it's an inconvenience for them. The world has made things so easy for them. Uh, to, it's so easy nowadays to get entertainment. Uh, if you have a smartphone, if you have a stable internet connection, entertainment is at the literally at your fingertips. Uh, it's it's yeah, everything has been made so convenient, and I put that in quotation marks that salvation has become inconvenient. Powerful, brother Enver. Powerful. Sorry, gentlemen, I had to just take uh, take my my video off. My battery just gave in as well. So I'm, I'm busy charging as we speak. <laughs> yeah, um, and it's so true what 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 um, Elder David is saying that um, you know. And I was I was actually going through um, during this week every day, each and every day. In fact, as well, even today on the Sabbath, as we made our way to church, and we went to to Tavels of Church today. And you know what? Um, the party just continues. <laughs> Amidst the restrictions, amidst everything that we're going through, amidst, you know, this pandemic has it, it, it brought about even even the poverty on, on some, you know, and um, if not most. And unfortunately, there are only a handful of people that really cares about their neighbor. And like David said, many a doors are being knocked at and people just don't take the warning signs serious enough as was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the last days as well. So we shouldn't be discouraged or we shouldn't feel that uh, we need to force people, but we need to lovingly. And when I look at it, the, the lesson, it's only God's grace and His, and His, and His saving power that, that, that continues on a continual basis, uh, pursues us. And, 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 and that is how we should approach as well. When we, when we go on, on evangelistic campaigns, we should always go out with the love of God and ask the Holy Spirit to lead, rather, so that we can touch people's lives. Not we, so that we can make, uh, well, <laughs> so that we can, uh, a seed maybe, uh, just put it, a seed. And then so that God will himself, through his Holy Spirit, germinate that seed um, to then change the behavior. But um, yeah, that beautiful, beautiful lesson once again. As we understand God's grace, we will understand the, the seriousness and the earnestness of this message. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much, Elder Enver and uh, Brother David. Elder David, so my point, I would say, um, I, I love that you brought a certain side to why the gospel seems unattractive. And I got to think that maybe we, as Christians who are presenting this gospel, actually live in double standards. Um, we appear to be like the Pharisees, where we are exacting, and yet we do the opposite. And that got me thinking as I was going through the lesson that probably when my neighbor sees me, I only greet them when I'm wearing a suit on a Sabbath. But during the week, I'm the most horrible person, such that when I go to them with the gospel, they want nothing to do with this Christ I'm preaching. And so 
my prayers that may I find grace in the eyes of the Lord, that I may change. And as I present this covenant that God wants to enter with his people, I may be able to present it in an attractive way that they may see Christ. And so that's what we need to pray about, that may we not be a deterrent to people who want to be saved because of our actions or our speech, but may we be attractive to bring people to God. Um, any final thoughts as we are looking at all future generations, what Noah did um, through his obedience um, to this covenant that God um, established, he was able to um, save his family. Any final thoughts, any um, comments before we end our lesson? Um, very simply, cling to what has been given you. But make sure that you are saved before you try saving someone else. I was in such a deep thought now, listening to what you said, the elder. Elder David, that I actually forgot my trail of thoughts, and I love it. I really love it. Um, the other given that beautiful, beautifully said. And I think just to add on, that is <laughs> this is a um, this is an awesome privilege given to us. Eh? I mean, the the angels will die to do what we have been afforded to do. So yeah, like you say, Elder Elder David, we need to make sure that our our houses are in order first before reaching out. And when we reach out, we need to realize that we have an awesome privilege. Um, just as I, I would like to think that, that Noah understood the calling, his purpose. And once we understand our calling, our purpose, um, it will be rather a much more a pleasure than a burden. Because I can imagine preaching for 120 years, day in, day out, and not seeing physically the result. And and even after long after the, 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 the door was shut, um, Elder David, um, seven days afterwards, you know, still nothing happened. What a faith, eh? We need to have a faith, um, even in the unseen. And I think then God will bless, bless everything that we do. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much, um, Elder David. Thank you, Elder Enver. We have a God who loves us so much that he doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's why he gave Noah to preach that message of the coming flood. And even today, God is preaching through the different Christians that there is a time that's coming when this world and the sin in the world has to be destroyed. So as he establishes that covenant that he wrote in our hearts, um, He's doing that so that you and I may be saved. And thank you so much to the panel um, for guiding us and for um, taking the lesson so beautifully and reminding us that as there was a man called Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, we also may do so uh, through Christ's righteousness. And uh, we're going to have our word of prayer. Uh, Brother David, would you be able to pray for us before we, we end the lesson? Shall we close our eyes for prayer? Say, Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us the example of now. Our prayer is simple tonight, dear Lord, that you would keep us faithful. Help us to be righteous and blameless in your sight. Help us to give the love and message and the warning that this world is coming to an end soon. But more than that, dear Lord, dear Father, um, I pray that you would give us the love, the endurance, and the wisdom to share Christ and him crucified. This we pray in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus and Savior with much thanksgiving and love. Amen. Amen. To all our viewers, friends, thank you so much for joining us once again. And we pray that God may continue to bless you, bless your families, and also to meet you at your point of need. And until our next meeting together, stay blessed and bye-bye.